So let's give a round of applause as Brother Howard comes up and he's going to share the word with us today. Come on, Brother Howard. Thank you, Brother Pastor. Praise the Lord. It's good to be with you once again here. This is our second time to come down here to your church. I first came to this area as a young man many years ago and I went to work for H.G. Hill. How many people remember H.G. Hill? Not many. That was a grocery chain, a big grocery chain. They later changed the name to Winn-Dixie. That's who Winn-Dixie was when I went to work for him, was H.G. Hill. That's a long time ago. Then for a while I worked for Kaiser Aluminum, Chalmette. Then for a while I worked for Lion Oil Company in Luling, Louisiana. So I've been in this area on and off over half my life around here. For 26 years I was a policeman in the city of New Orleans. And for a while I was on the state police, the Louisiana State. So I'm very familiar with the area. I lived here over half my life, so <clears throat> it's good to be back. And it's good to see all you beautiful people in church today. Ugly people stayed away. <laughs> Only the pretty people came, you see. And it's good to see you all in church. I'm always glad when they say, let's go to the house of the Lord. We don't hear that enough nowadays, to go to the house of the Lord. We're in a time when we got what the prophet said was coming toward the end. That's a great falling away. We have a great falling away going on today in our churches across the land. We need more voices thundering out there, wake up. The giant has gone to sleep. The church, the bride of Christ, is going to sleep. We need to wake it up. We need to wake it up. We're in very perilous times right now. We're on a slippery slope. And we're in danger of sliding even deeper. We have to learn what's going on around us all the time. The prophet said in Psalms chapter 78 that when the Messiah comes to the earth, he will teach in parables. Mysteries that have been kept secret since the foundation of the world. And when Jesus came, he started teaching in parables the same thing. The mysteries that have been kept secret since the foundation of the world. Every parable in the Bible contains a great mystery that's been kept secret since the foundation of the world. If you look at those parables, for instance, take the first four parables in the 13th chapter of Matthew, what great secrets or mysteries that are exposed in those four, four parables. And Jesus said, <clears throat> when his disciples said to him, why are you teaching in parables? Because he said, it is given unto you to understand, but to them it's not given. So since he gave you the knowledge of those mysteries, I'm sure you know what they are because it's given unto you. Of course, like every good manual, every good manual has an instruction of use. It tells you how to use it. This Bible is the best manual of all. It has no exception. It has its own instructions on how to use it. It says, study, S-T-U-D-Y, to show yourself Approved workman for God by learning to rightly divide the word of truth. And that's how you find those mysteries that Jesus was talking about. You have to learn to rightly divide the word of truth. There's many ways to take a single verse. But this Bible is not in chronological order. Neither is it in subject order. So what you have to do when you study, you remember when you was in school and the teacher said for you to study, we're going to have a test Thursday? <laughs> you prepared for it. You studied. You didn't just read your textbook. You studied. 
How much more important is the information in this Bible that you need to know right now? The mysteries that Jesus was teaching in the parable were secret since the foundation of the world. I remember one time I was in, uh, uh, I think it was, uh, I believe it was Colorado, in a cold winter night. And I was traveling in a, a diesel operated engine, a vehicle. And you know, in, in cold weather, real cold weather, and that really gets cold up there in the winter time, you have to plug those engines in to keep them warm or they won't start. You have to keep them warm. So I was looking for a place because I had one meeting in this town, and from there I had to go to another town the same night. So I went into, uh, uh, I saw a road, a big long row of trucks plugged, plugged in over there by a motel. I went over to the motel to see if I could park, in, park my vehicle and plug it in to the electricity to keep it warm because I knew I had to go about 100 more miles that same night. And the lady operated the motel and she, she saw my vehicle. I had a sign on the side of it that says, Jesus Christ, he is the real thing. I had it written in Coca-Cola script, like Coke is a real thing. I had Jesus Christ, he is a real thing. She said, would you tell me something? Are you a preacher? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, you believe in uh, you have to be born, I said, born again? I said, well, sure you do. Well, could you explain it to me? I've asked every minister in this city to explain to me how you get born again. And not a single one of them could do it. Could you tell me? You see, that's the first mystery that Jesus revealed in the 13th chapter of Matthew. How to be born spiritually. That's the parable of the sower. And he took four individuals to give you an example, example of what was happening there. Going for salvation. Read that very carefully. You'll see that only one made it through. That's something to think about. Something to think about. I was in Singapore a few years ago teaching uh, on the subject of spiritual warfare. And oh, are we deeply, this deep in spiritual warfare now. And I was teaching on that subject. We had 15,000 people there as delegates to the convention. After one of the first sessions, gentleman came up to me and says, uh, you, 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 you talked about hell tonight. Sure did. He said, you know what it looks like? So what do you mean what it looks like? He said, would you like to see what hell looks like? I wouldn't want to see it firsthand. Said, but I want you to go out to Singapore Park. The Buddhists have built hell. What they believe hell looks like. Buddhists. Yes. They built a replica of what they held, what they believe hell looks like. I said, the Buddhists believe in hell? They don't believe in the Bible. I don't care what they believe in. They believe in hell. Because they have built a replica in Singapore Park. Still stands there today. So I had to go see what hell looks like. I went out to Singapore Park, and I see this dome-like building. that's sort of covered with material that looks like Glass, you can see through because the building is divided into little cubicles. And every one of the cubicles, every one of the cubicles, they have a manning, manning that represents the spirit of a human being that's gone to hell. And they have two more mannequins representing demons torturing him. And this is what Buddhists believe that hell looks like. And I began to go around that building and I looked and I looked and I looked. And I saw all different kind of torture taking place that you can imagine. It wasn't the same. And I wondered, I can't get the church to believe that hell is real and here the Buddhists who don't even believe the Bible. Well, don't not only believes it, but was demonstrating what the Bible said that there are different levels of punishment in hell. Remember what Jesus said? 
Some will be beaten with few stripes and some with many. There is different levels of punishment in hell. And the Buddhist was demonstrating that in their, what they declared hell looked like. I don't know where they got it from. They don't read the Bible. They don't believe the Bible, but that was in the Bible. So hell is real. August the 3rd, 1979, a paramedic judged me to be dead in an ambulance. We were traveling from one hospital. I was being transferred to another hospital because the doctors working on me feared that the uh, internal hemorrhage was quickly taking my life. They wanted to move me to a larger facility that had better equipment and more skilled technicians. But 19 miles before we reached that hospital, all my vital life signs failed. The paramedic judged me to be dead. He picked up the radio microphone. He called the hospital ahead. He reported the patient has died. All the vital life signs have failed. Prepared the emergency room in an attempt to revive him and have a physician meet us on the ramp. Approximately 15 minutes after that, we arrived at the Hospital Regional Medical Center at Macomb, Mississippi. Dr. Sidney Ross, head of surgery, was standing on that ramp. As they took my body out of the ambulance, he cut my chest open outside the hospital with a razor blade and began to infuse blood directly into one, to my body cavity. Later, they had me inside the emergency room where Dr. Ross, by, assisted by six other physicians, worked on this body over around the body from 4 p.m. till 12 midnight in an attempt to, to revive my vital life signs. They very quickly restored my vital life signs, but they could not stabilize them. It was all the way up to midnight before Dr. Ross felt that they were stable enough to transfer me to the intensive care unit where he and one of his assistants worked on me throughout the wee hours of the morning. Six o'clock on Saturday morning, the vital life signs began to fail again. He came out of the surgery and told my wife he'd done everything he could. It's in God's hands now. She said, you can't quit, doctor. You can't quit. He said, well, the only other thing I can do is, is surgery because it's going to be a major surgery. And he's lost too much blood. He's too weak. He can't withstand the trauma. She said, is there a chance? It's any kind of chance. He said, well, uh, there's always a chance. But he said, in my expert opinion, he won't survive the trauma of major surgery. She said, well, do it. And they carried me back into surgery where he and his assistants worked on me and came out at 4 p.m. Saturday afternoon. This was a tremendous battle that was going on in the physical world that entire weekend from 5 o'clock Friday afternoon till 7 o'clock Monday morning. I didn't know anything in the physical realm while that great battle was taking place. The battle was between the medical people and this battle. They was trying to preserve whatever spark of life that was in it. And I thank God for that kind of dedication. Because Dr. Ross spent the entire Friday night with me from 5 o'clock Friday afternoon until 7 o'clock. Uh, well, I don't know what time he left, but he was there when I opened my eyes Monday morning. He was the first man I saw in intensive care. And he said to his nurse, come see the miracle man. He was testifying that a miracle had occurred because he said nobody having lost that much blood in that short period of time, could survive. But I thought he knew all about my experience I had while I was in the spirit world. And I started to tell him about him, and he got frightened and ran out of the room. <laughs> I haven't seen Dr. Ross since then. My sister saw him one time. He was transferred to... Women's, women's Hospital in Baton Rouge. You might be there now, or he's probably, that was close to 40 years ago, and he was about uh, 60 when that happened, so he might be going home. I don't know. Haven't seen him in all these times. <clears throat> but during the course of that weekend, I can't tell you how long this experience lasted, because in the spirit realm, there is no concept of time. 
You don't, you can't measure time. There's no time there. There's no time in the spirit realm. And there's no concept of it. Here we have a concept of how long it takes us to walk from here to the door. There you don't have any concept of time at all. Because you can't measure it. And there is no time. And that's why God said to him one day is like a thousand years or a thousand years one day. There's no time. So we have to view things different when we start thinking about eternity. Far different from the physical realm. For we're here. And the way we look at time is draw a circle. It starts up here and it goes around. It comes back to where it starts. That's time. Well, as we travel this circle, we can look behind us and see what happened. But we can't look forward and see what's going to happen. Oh, we can look at our tracks past, but we don't know what they're going to be in the future. But God's different because he's not subject to time. He's not in that time. He's out here on the outside. He was up there when he started. He's already saw it go all the way around. He knows what's happened when it gets to the end. He's not in time. We are. And when we think about eternity and spiritual work, we've got to change the concepts that we have in our mind. After <clears throat> when I opened my eyes in the spiritual realm, the first thing I saw was a living verse of scripture being acted out before my eyes like a stage play. I want to read that verse of scripture to you. So many people don't realize that everything in the spirit world is orchestrated. By that I mean it's planned. It's all planned. Satan's master attack plan that is in effect right now was planned eons of time ago to come to pass and we are that generation that's bringing it to pass here. The first thing I saw it was like a movie screen actually being shown before me because I was looking at this. this there was a long table and all these beings sitting around that table. At the head of the table was the chief himself, the master enemy. It was Ephesians. What I'm looking at was Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Being acted out before my eye. So I was about to see with my very eyes the war room, you might say, of the satanic world. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. It says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, plural, powers, plural, the princes of this world, plural, and high, wicked, spiritual places. What it's talking about is a menagerie of enemies in the spiritual world that's orchestrating a plan to kill you. They're murderers. They're liars. They're thieves. And you know what they've done this morning while you sit here in church? Look about you. How many empty seats have they kept you today? They're responsible for that. They are responsible for that. Every empty seat in this building today. Because it wasn't important to those people. It wasn't important for them to be here to know. That's why they're not here. They didn't make a choice to find out. But they will give an account of that failure. They will give an account. And it will not be long. Because we are the generation 
that's ushering in that day. It's not too far away. I don't know the day and hour. I just know the time we're in. And I know where we are. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 talks about the satanic, demonic kingdom where the warfare plans are literally drawn up against the saints of God. Their plan against you is, attack plan is orchestrated. It's done by design. How they do that, <clears throat> these are the princes of the satanic realm. Prince is in charge of principality. The word used there is principality. A principality is a single territory. For instance, we will cre create a, principal a principality here, hypothetically. And most likely it's not only hypothetically, it's probably real. This fellowship is a probably sing a single principality. In that case, it would have a single prince in charge of it. He's not down here. He's sitting up there in the spiritual realm by that command table. But what he does is, it is his duty to author, author a plan against you as an individual. In order to do that, he has to know your weakness or perceived weaknesses. And therefore, he has to assign to you a personal spirit that becomes your life companion. And you're never without him. Even today, you know, he goes to church every time you do. He's with you constantly. And he knows more, or it knows more about you than your spouse will ever know. You have no secrets, none whatsoever. I was traveling out of Canada not long ago, and they put me in one of the machines where they took my picture. <laughs> and then when I got out, the man said, there ain't no more secrets. And I said, well, but it's different with those spirits. They know every secret that you got. Even more than your spouse. And they, that information goes back to that prince. When they search you, they may not know all of your weaknesses, but they know your perceived weaknesses based on what you do, what you say, where you go, and what you like. They know what they think will tempt you. And what may not tempt you. What may tempt you may not tempt, tempt, tempt the next person. One that tempts him may not take another one. So this is, I saw this thing at work. And I was amazed at that plan. How long it took them to put it in place. Now, Revelation tells us in... Uh, Chapter 12, verse 13, was the next thing they showed me about what that plan is going to produce. And it says, um, I want to read that for you. And Revelation 12, 12, I got to get to that chapter just a minute. I saw, well, I saw the wrong chapter. Uh, how easy for me to miss these chapters. Let me go back. I was in the wrong book. That's pretty good. And uh, now these same spirits, I want to read this one first. It's in uh, Revelation 16, verse 13. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs. Now, I won't read this one because they took me out after this experience. Uh, they took me, the people in the hospital where I was recruiting. I asked them, I said, do, do you have a break room where, where the, the people go for on a break? They said, do. I said, could I see that break room? Because when I was in the spirit, 
They carried me into that break room, and that's where I saw this frog-like spirit operating. I'm reading about him right here in the 16th chapter of Revelation, verse 13. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles. You hear that? Spirits can work miracles. They can. And that's part of their major deceptive plan. You have somebody up here telling you that God sent me to bring you a message and he calls fire down from heaven. What are you going to say? Oh, that's got to be from God. Believe not every spirit, but try them. For many false spirits are going into the world. You're going to see in this last generation a supernatural act of fireworks performed by these demon spirits. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth to the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. The battle of Armageddon. The last great battle. That's when Satan's going to bring out all of his toys, shake them all in front of the eyes of the people, and he's going to bring the greatest deception the world has ever seen right through the church. False miracles. False miracles. You better know God's Word. The only way you can tell the difference is you've got to know God's Word. God's Word. Because the false miracles will be there. They will be there. <clears throat> Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth the garment. Lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together in the place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. That's what that great show that they're going to put on in the church. Is to leave the people through great deception. It's easy to believe in miracles. Why? Hollywood has been working for 50 years to get you to believe in miracles. And every time you turn on the television, you see all them miracles that they perform on right before your eyes. Your children has been educated. No, that's nothing. That's nothing. I see that every day they turn on the television. A lot of preparation went into preparing you for what's going to come. How easy it is to be deceived. To be deceived. And that's exactly what they're going to do. They're going to deceive the church. That's why one of the prophets said, God will go home with the most 10% of his people. 10% of his people. Think of that. Worldwide. Worldwide. Only 10 people. I mean 10%, excuse me, not 10 people, 10%. 10%. One of the prophets said. We don't know exactly. We, we, we believe what the Bible says. We go with what it says. And we think about that. They were showing me also... The, uh, uh, in the, uh, uh, they wanted me to see what they call the uh, skeleton of Satan's master plan. For it is given unto him in this master plan to deceive the world. Now, he's going to deceive the world. We see him in the person of the Antichrist. Satan is going to come in the person of the Antichrist. In the first place, we see his major disguise. Most people don't even notice it. But uh, if you look at the sixth chapter of Revelation, and I saw when the Lamb opened the seal, and I heard as it was a noise of thunder, and one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw and behold a white horse. 
the white horse? Who rides the white horse on your television and your movies? The good guy, the good guy, only the good guy. You never see the bad guy get on a white horse. Conditioning, conditioning. The guy that rides the white horse is the one that comes to save the damsel in distress. Only this, though, look a little further. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. He had a crown. Sure, he was a ruler. Had a bow. Shows his authority. What he, what he didn't have was an arrow. He had no weapon. But he's going to deceive the church. Watch him. The church will beat his drum and carry his flag through the greatest deception the world has ever known. This is why it behooves you to know the spirit that you're listening to. You first got to know God's word. Great battle lies ahead. A great battle lies ahead. It's coming. They brought out the skeleton and let me see it. It was the master plan. The master plan Satan has to deceive the church. And uh, because it is given unto him to overcome the church. Now that shook me when I read that. Because it, why would he give it to him under? Why would God give it to him? The point is, God didn't give it to him. He gave you the authority over the devil. Did you know that? If the devil rounds, winds up with that authority, who gives it to him? You do. Through the greatest deception the church has ever seen. This is why you've got to know you have got to know the Word. It is only by the Word that you can know. Because it is given unto you to overcome. And you were given this. And the Bible tells us that the gifts and calling of the Spirit are without repentance. When God gives you a commission, when He gives you a calling, he don't take it back. But you can give it back. You can give it away. Satan knows this. And this is his plan. This is his plan. And that's exactly what they're doing. Now we go to verse 13. <clears throat> and it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds, all tongues, and all nations. And all that dwell upon the earth. Keep hearing that A-L-L. That includes you and me. All, all, all. Oh, I'm too smart. He can't get me. <laughs> Wait and see. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. Talking about Satan. Whose names are not written in the book of the life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man hath an ear, let him hear. Revelation chapter 13 verse 7 through 9. It is given him to overcome the church. And all who dwell upon the earth shall worship him if their name you have one chance to escape your name has to be in that book that means Jesus must be personal he has to be a personal savior you have to know him but he has to know you and he said in the seventh chapter of Matthew for many will say to me on that day but Lord, Lord, have I done many marvelous works in your name? I cast out devils in your name. I preached in your name. 
I've done many marvelous works in your name. And I will say unto them, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. I never knew you. See, that's why it's important that he knows us. He knows us. While I was touring this world, I got to see the five orders of demons that he set out to condition the world to surrender. And the last generation of time to the Antichrist. And for a while, he basically is going to rule this earth, the Antichrist. Days of martyrs will return. The church was born in a blaze of glory. <clears throat> How did he get the word out of Jerusalem? How did God send the word to the world? Do you remember reading? How come the people left Jerusalem? Fear and the sword and the whip. He had to drive them out. He had to drive the word out. Make the people take it. Run in from the sword and the whip. The days are coming again. Oh, how easy it is to be a Christian today. We bring a preacher a dollar, ten dollars, sometimes we even give him five dollars, something like that, and he gets up and preaches and teaches. And we go home and wait for the next time, but we don't open our Bible. It's still covered with dust. We don't do what we are instructed to do. While I was in this realm looking at these spirits, I was given an opportunity to see this frog-like creature at work. And I want to tell you about him. You've been reading about him. And the headlines of the papers just recently. Because just about every state in the nation's passed the laws to protect him. He is the spirit that's responsible for same-sex marriage, homosexuality. And that's his area of expertise. And that's the spirit that's supposed to set the world up, condition the world. All Satan has to do is like when you gather plums, if you just touch one, it's overripe, it falls into your hand. And that's what he's doing to the church today. I saw this frog-like spirit at work. The angels brought me into this bake room break room while I was in the spirit this is of course time while they were doing surgery on my body I wasn't in my body they were escorting me through the spirit world and I was allowed to see they wanted me they told me we want to see you we want you to see with your eyes a single man be actually being possessed by this most despicable of all the spirits the frog like spirit so they brought me into this a break room it was a break room where the employees of the hospital get to go for their break. And in this room was a young man and a young lady. That's all the people was in this room. But I was in it, and the three angels escorting me were in it. But they didn't know we were there. They couldn't see us. But I could see them. And I could hear every word they said, and I understood every word they said. But standing between them on the floor was this frog-like creature. I mean, he didn't look exactly like a frog. He just looked like a frog. It resembled a frog. Green, stuffed, slimy thing. All out of shape and all out of proportion. Just as we got there, he left the area of that floor. And he slowly ri was rising in front of that man. And wherever that man's eyes looked, that thing was there. Just like he was locked on his eyes. Just locked on his eyes. Man, look over here, that thing was there. Look over there, he was there. Just that fast, just that fast. And I'm watching. I'm overwhelmed watching that thing as he moved up. Got right in his face, puff, and it disappeared. Went right through his eyes. Right through his eyes. The angels turned me around. They said to me, there, you saw it for what it really is. That man wanted that thing. 
But to you, it was despicable, and it was horrible. But to him, it was beautiful, and it was desirable. See how it is today? Perversion. Perversion. And the education of it starts very early in life for young children. Satan is in control of the television industry. And it's its biggest, its biggest missionary for the world right now. He's preparing everybody with television. So nothing will mean anything when they see fire from home, help them, you know. Because they see more than that every day on the television. All this stuff that you put on every day. All coming. As I traveled through that world, I saw these different orders of spirit. The first one I saw was a giant warring demon. It was from that order that I got my own stalker. The giant warring, warring demon are beautiful creatures. Now, they look about uh, 12, 14 feet tall if you could see them in the physical realm and they color uh, like polished bronze. That's what they look like, bronze. Beautiful. And uh, they are the enforcers of the satanic realm. They enforce the orders of their master. And one thing we learned while we was there, that there is no love in the spiritual world. Think of this. Those spirits are wedded to a master they must obey for eternity. And there's no love. The emotion that you have there is both hate and fear. Both which are foreign to the human nature. Hate and fear. It comes from, the, from that realm. From that realm. The next I saw the second most powerful demon spirit. The most powerful as far as the, the world is concerned is giant war and demon. They're responsible for wars and rumors of wars and, and creating wars amongst fellowships and homes and in nations. Wherever there's a disturbance, it's, it's a result of their... The second most, most powerful spirit is the good old boy, I call him, because that's what he reminded me of. The good old boy, the demon of greed, deputy commander, and he's visited a lot of our homes constantly. All of these are setting up the conditions right for the Antichrist to take over the world. Won't be long till he's going to take over the world because the time is coming. But we do have hope. As long as there's a voice of warning, we have hope. God warned the world <clears throat> for a hundred years while Noah built the ark. The world had 100 years of warning. But you know, not a single person on earth heard him. He preached for a hundred years and never made a single convert. He didn't even convert his family. God gave him his family because of his obedience, but he didn't convert them. For a hundred years, Noah preached and didn't convert anybody. Kind of discouraging, huh, preacher? You preach a hundred years and don't reach the one. But he kept going. Nobody believed him. Why? Why couldn't they, just one person believe him? Because he was telling them something that had never happened before. See, he said it's going to rain. Water's going to fall out of the sky. Up until that time, not one drop of water had ever fallen out of the sky. For 1,500 years, the first 1,500 years of creation, God watered the earth with dew. With the dew. He didn't rain on the earth. So humans had never seen rain. But Noah was telling them it's going to rain. And they go, that crazy old man, no, that's against nature. It ain't going to rain. Ain't no water going to fall. He's crazy. He's crazy. Now listen. Carefully. Can you hear it? That voice in the distance says it's going to rain fire. You know it's never rained fire before. See, you never saw water, fire fall from heaven before, did you? Well, those people never saw water fall from heaven before. But they did see it. 
And what happened? It eat them up. They drowned with it. They had a hundred years to believe an old man. Crazy old preacher. And not one of them believed him. You listen. You hear a few telling about the fire's going to fall from heaven. It's never rained fire before either. But it's going to rain fire. The Bible said it's coming. That's the supernatural fireworks the enemy is going to use to defeat, deceive the church with. It's going to work. Sure it's worked. John said it worked. People believed it. They're so hungry for a miracle, they'll take it. Any way they can get it. TV or otherwise. Otherwise. The greatest miracle of all is that second birth. Learn it. Study that miracle. And that is a miracle of the second birth. The first, very first parable in the 13th chapter of the book of Matthew. The second parable is the mystery of the, of the uh, leaven. That means 99% of God's word if it's got 1% of lies, it's no good. It's got to be 100% God's word. That's no good. The third parable talks about the condition of the church, Jesus Christ, in the last day. And it'll have more tares than it will have wheat because they're deceived. They're deceived. All of this lies ahead of us. <clears throat> Satan is determined to take this world. And John the, Bab John the Revelator said he saw him, saw him do it. But his victory will be short-lived. It will be short-lived. Because we know our Savior is going to win in the battle. He's going to win in the end. But... Our goal is to be in his number. So many not going to make it because this world, just you see the empty seats, where are they? Where are the people who should be setting those empty seats today? This is not important to them or they would have been here. Wherever they are, that's important to them. They've made a decision. They have decided to be where they at today. And it was not church. Because that means church was not important enough for them to be here. In church. We're faced with this every day of our life. From here to the end. We're at war. And no war is pleasant. This is spiritual war at its height. And nowhere, no war, nowhere. So Jesus said, in teaching the mysteries of these parables that uh, these were secrets or mysteries that was kept secret since the foundation of the world. But he come now to, to teach his people the truth because it's given unto them to know. But it requires studying of his word. Just like you were required to study your textbook in school in order to pass the test. You couldn't pass the test just by reading it. You had to study it. And that's exactly what he's saying today. So many Christians forget that God is sovereign. What does that mean, sovereign? It means that not even a tiny sparrow falls to the ground without his knowledge. That means that even the hairs on your head are numbered. Of course, he don't have too much trouble with me. But a lot of people, he does. Now think about that. Just think about all the people sitting in here today. Suppose we had to know the number of all the hairs on everybody's head. At the same time, the Bible said God knows that. He's sovereign. He's sovereign. There's nothing that escapes him. Nothing. This is a sovereign God. 
Even a tiny sparrow can't fall to the ground without God's permission or knowledge. I know that. How wonderful. <clears throat> we looked not long ago, I was hearing a man talk about he had a vision. He had a vision of going to hell, see what it was like. Well, he wasn't at Singapore, so I don't know if you ever saw that one over there or not, but I did. This fellow says the angels was escorting him on the very banks of hell, let him see the fire that was burning. And he saw a cage-like apparatus where somebody was hanging upside down in the cage. Looked like had uh, little animals gnawing at his body. And he said he looked at that and he, he asked the angels escorting him, who, who, who is that? Who is that? And the angel told him, that's one who would have been better never have to been born. That was Judas. The one that betrayed Jesus. That was his vision. And just think if that really was, if, it really, if he was really having a vision, what was that? Think of Judas 2,000 years ago. And punishment like that today, today, while we're here. There's no end to the punishment of those who reject Christ. No end. No end. Our hope and our hope only is always in God. I know now that <clears throat> you are definitely, if you belong to Christ, you are definitely the light of this world. We hear people talk all the time about American exceptionalism. I don't know. America is an unusual country. I know that. I love it or hate it. We have to admit that something special about it. I remember in the, in the 50s, 1950s, the greatest wheat crop ever produced in the world was produced in America. They had so much wheat that the granaries, granaries couldn't, couldn't hold them. Couldn't hold the wheat. They couldn't get rid of it. That was a time when the United States government had a subsidy on the farmers for growing wheat. So the government would buy the wheat from the farmers. But all the granaries were filled up. They had no place to put it. Had so much wheat produced in this country. No country in the world ever done anything like that. But this country did. So what did they do with that wheat? They gave it to all the big cities to use as filling for their, black, for their pavement. Instead of sand, they paved over wheat that could have made bread, the bread of life. That was in the 50s because that's how great the wheat harvest was for this nation in the 1950s. No country in the world has ever produced as much food. Even Abraham Lincoln, when he's president, says we we have been blessed with the most fertile soil in the world. And for what reason? He didn't know what reason. Why was this country so blessed? Why was it so blessed? Even the Bible refers to the light of the world actually being God's people. And so many of our presidents used this reference in Matthew about being the light of the world. They call it the shining city on a hill. Talking about America. They too didn't know or didn't understand why it was so exceptional. What made it so great. How come God blessed us so much? So much. More than any other nation on earth. This is exactly... <clears throat> What <clears throat> one of the great preachers in 1630 that came over in the first group told the people at Boston, Massachusetts in a sermon that he preached to them. It's recorded in the history book. He talked about while they was trying to establish a city on a hill called Boston. He said, you can make this the shining city on the hill. 
You can make it the center of Christian charity, or you can fail. Whatever you do, the world's going to know it because they're watching everything you do. That's what's happening. <clears throat> For 40 years now, I've traveled this world. I've been around it three times. I've everywhere, just about every continent, I've stood wherever the body of Christ meets. I've seen every kind of service it's imaginable to see and uh, people. But one thing I've learned that I've observed wherever I go, they watch in America. The world's watching you with hungry eyes. That's why you couldn't build a fence high enough to keep them out. A border wide enough to keep them away. Because the world. And if they can't come, they turn that desire into hate of you. They hate you because you were blessed. And they were not. They hate you. You are the light of the world. Live to your potential for God. For God. It is indeed incumbent upon each of us to be accountable for what God has given us. For we will answer to him one day for what he's given us. The, one of the parables that he gave told that same story. I believe it's in Luke where he said the uh, farmer gave to he called his four of his servants in. He gave each one, each one of them a certain amount of talents. He said, I'm going on a journey. And while I'm going, you put my talents to work and earn for me money. When he come back, the first servant wrote his talents and says, Master, here are your talents. And I earned ten, five more for you, so here they are. He said, well done, a good and faithful servant. Because you've been faithful over a few things, I'm going to make you ruler over five cities. Next one brought ten. He was great too. He got reward. Third one was great. He got reward. But the fourth one comes and says, Master, I know that you're an astute man and I, I was af afraid to lose your talent, so I hit him and here's your talent. And he called him a wicked servant for not using the talent. The mystery behind that was these servants never asked to be, to use his talent for him while he was gone. But he required they become responsible for him. And that's just like we are responsible for what Jesus gives us. He said, whatsoever your hands find to do, do it with all your might to the glory of God. To the glory of God. I had a brother-in-law <clears throat> that believed in that philosophy. He was a carpenter maker. One of the finest carpenter makers in this country. He's been dead about 40 years now. He died rather young. But he was a great carpenter maker. And he wanted to train his son to be a carpenter maker. His son was my cousin. And uh, every time they had built these big beautiful homes and the contractors wanted an expert carpenter maker, they'd get him to make these carpenters. They can can cabinets, that's what it was, cabinets. He was a cabinet maker. And one day he gave one of the home to my nephew to build. He said, now you, here's the plans. You're going to do this by yourself. When you get it done, call me and I'll come and inspect it. So when he got done, he was proud of his work. He looked all over. He couldn't find a flaw. He called his dad. His dad come and looked at it and he says, open it. He said, well, it looks good on the outside. But look here. He found a flaw when he opened the door to the cabin. He said, we'll have to do it over. But dad, he said, nobody can see that. You're the only person in the world who would ever notice that. He said, Jesus saw it. And we worked for him. That was his philosophy. He really believed that people paid him. But he wasn't working for the people. He was working for Jesus. I had a friend of mine that was pastor of a church in St. Louis, Missouri. Had the same philosophy. Only the second other human that I run into had it. He was a very educated man. He worked in the office of a big airplane factory over there. And he did the payroll and everything for the people. And he kept on his supervisor said, look at the people on the assembly line out there. They're getting paid by piecework. 
They make twice as much money as I do. Transfer me out there and let me work out there for a while. But he was good at what he did in the office. They wouldn't, for the longest, they wouldn't transfer him. And finally, they transferred him. They transferred him out to the lounge. His name was P-I-Pig. P-I-G-G was his name. Pastor Pig. And uh, uh, he worked out there in the air, airplane factory for, for a whole week till the man next to him come to him one day and says, Hey, slow down. You're making us look bad. Slow down. You're making us look bad. And, well, wait a minute. I, I didn't come out here to make you look bad. I come out here to, to make me some money by working the pieces. You know, uh, I, 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 I'm doing this for the Lord. I'm a Christian. I believe I have to do everything I do with all my might. That's what the Bible said. Yeah, but don't. you you got to slow down. But he wouldn't slow down. Man kept bugging him for about two or three weeks. And finally... The union representative come out and said, hey, you fixed the cause of strike. We're going to strike if you don't slow down. You're making these people look bad. He quit. Went to pastor the church. He wouldn't work there. He gave his job up because he wouldn't slow down. Now that's the way we are as Christians. We won't slow down, will we? We just keep going. Do it every day. Every day. I saw the five orders of spirits that Satan used. The war and demon. The demon of greed. The frog-like spirit. And the heralding angels that are described in the Bible as looking like animals. You got those are the religious spirits. They half human, half I mean, it, all kind of grotesque creatures you see. But they're powerful. The, the uh, spirit, false spirits are very powerful. Very powerful in what they do. Because they go to church more than most of us do. And this is where the battle is today. The battle is for the life of the church. The life of the church. Because we've got the great falling away going. And we have evidence of the enemies by the empty seats in our church buildings throughout the land. Not the only place. I've been at this for 40 years, traveling the world. And I see today the falling away is like a surge throughout the body of Christ. Everywhere I go, I'm finding more and more empty seats in church buildings. I'm finding more and more churches that go out of existence, that actually fail. Sometimes I get an invitation to go to church and I got so much in a, a head I can't go for a year and when I get there they already close. They're already gone out of existence because of the great falling away. Falling away that's taking place in our country today. Satan is real. The demons are real. And the satanic war against the people of God is in full throttle today. It's in full throttle today. I wished I had more time to talk about spiritual warfare. I really wasn't going to talk about spiritual warfare today, but the Lord put me on that track. So that's nothing unusual. He's changed my tone Many times, because I never rehearse to myself what I'm going to talk about, I always say, Lord, have your way. But I have in my mind generally what I want to speak on. And today what I wanted to speak on was totally different from what the Lord had me speak on here today. So it's got to be important to you. Because whatever he gives me to give to the people, he has somebody there that needs it. I don't know who's sitting out there. I don't know what you, what you need in your life, but he does. He knows every, per, every person. He knows every secret and he knows every thought of the heart of every individual. And therefore, that's why many times he changes me on what I'm going to speak on to what he wants me to speak on. Because there's some individual that somewhere out there needs at least part of what I was talking about has a need for it 
And God's in business of giving to his children what they need. We've been studying quite a bit of it in the book of Judges about how many times God raised up terrible people to deliver his people out of bondage. You see, a lot of people don't realize that sometimes they just, God will use evil to work good. For instance, he said, Behold my servant, Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was the most evil man in the Bible, but yet God called him his servant. Why? Because he used him to bring judgment upon Judah. He wanted to bring judgment upon the Jews of Judah, and he used Nebuchadnezzar to do it. He had Nebuchadnezzar capture Jerusalem and kill or take captive King Zedekiah, the last king of Israel, and kill all of his sons so nobody could destroy the throne, he thought. That's what he was trying to do. Yet God called him Nebuchadnezzar, his servant, because he was going to use him to bring judgment. He uses evil people sometimes to perform good tasks that they don't know they're performing. They do not know they're performing. But everybody has a calling of some kind. And God knows every individual. That's the thing about it. Well, praise the Lord. <clears throat> I want to ask you, if you would, to stand with me just a moment before we close. Before I ask the Lord, to ask the pastor to come and close, I want to tell you that God has a message for you. I don't know who you are that he had a special message for here today, but you are in this audience, whoever you are. I'll tell you this. He said in his word that if we deny him in this life, he will deny us before his Father which is in heaven. And that is a choice we're going to have to make. If you have ever had the opportunity to acknowledge Jesus and you didn't acknowledge him, you will give an account for it one day. But he doesn't take prisoners. He takes only those who willingly come to him. Now, he says we all have in our tongue the power of life and death. We don't want to speak death today. We want to speak life. But we, we can speak death with our tongue. He said that. In our tongue we have the power of life and death. I'm going to say a very simple prayer today. It's a sinner's prayer. Who's asking forgiveness. Seeking salvation. And then I'm going to add to it somebody who has doubts about their own salvation and who want to make a dedication of their life to Jesus Christ. Now he said, where two or more are gathered together in my name, I will be in the midst. So I know I came in his name. You came in his name. So we know he's here. He's here. He comes in the midst. He said, if just two of us come in his name, he also said in that same sentence, if we two agree on one need, he will grant it. Now, if you have a need that only God can grant, and you will use it for the kingdom's glory, for God's glory, I will agree with you today that God grants you your request. So if you have that request, while I pray this simple prayer, just lift your hand to heaven and make your confession in your heart to Jesus what you're asking for. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to come and speak your word today. Lord, you said in your word that if we believe in our heart, if we would confess with our mouth, if we would repent with our life, you would save our soul. Today, I believe in my heart. With my mouth, I confess you. With my mind, I trust you for strength. Father, I know that there are some of us in this building 
that had tried to play a game with you but trying to hide from you some personal sin I come and ask you to forgive us today of that I confess you today as my Savior and I thank you for saving my soul Father I know that Satan has a trap set for every one of us in this building this day even before the day ends I ask that you reveal that trap to us that we don't fall into it this day I make that confession here with my tongue today I invite you to be the Lord of all my life thank you Father for this opportunity to come and speak to this fellowship today in your precious name we pray Amen and Amen raise your hands and would decree a blessing would you decree a blessing with me amen I always bless this, uh, everyone in church in the end so I want you to decree a blessing Father we ask you in your name to bless this man to bless these people for this light that he've established here and all those that work so hard to keep this light shining bring a special blessing into their life this day before the sun sets today let them know that with this day your hand passed through their life in your name we pray amen Amen and amen. God bless you. Glory to God. Alicia, be blessed.